is going to be about two uh, related topics uh, in infinity two category theory. <clears throat> so I want to talk about uh, the great tensor product uh, in this context and uh, lax functors again for infinity two categories and then uh, see how these two things um, are related. <clears throat> and uh, so this is uh, joint work with Andrea Gagna and Jonathan Harpatz and Part of the motivation for this is to give a proof of, of some statements that appeared in the literature in uh, Gates, Corey, and Rosenblum's book, Appendix, uh, without, without, a, without a proof. So uh, this is part of an ongoing project, and um, we don't uh, prove exactly the same statement. We prove an analogous statement in our context, and then the remaining issue is to essentially compare um, how the two definitions, um, if, if they agree or not. And, and uh, of course, we, we suspect that they, that they do. So let me start with a, with a brief, uh, hopefully brief <laughs> introduction on, on two-dimensional category theory uh, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with it. So um, uh, we think of two categories as being categories enriched over the monoidal category of, of categories with the usual Cartesian products. Uh, what, what this means is that uh, essentially, so this is sort of the um, formal definition, but uh, in fact, what we need is just that we have access to a two dimensional structure where we have objects uh, such X and Y, we have one cells, uh, and then we have two cells, which are morphisms between uh, one cells or morphism between arrows. So. You can think of alpha as being a morphism in this category. In particular, given any pair of objects um, in C, we're, we're, we are given uh, a, uh, an ordinary one category of morphisms uh, between them. So this is a two-dimensional structure. And uh, morphisms between um, such structures consist of assignments on these zero, one, and two cells, and they have to satisfy all the coherence constraints uh, that you can possibly imagine on the nodes. So um, you have an assignment. So objects in C are sent to objects in D. One cells in C are sent to one cells in D, respecting uh, the assignment on source and target. Same thing for two cells. And then it has to respect the um, possible compositions that you can come up with. So there's just one for one cells, but there are two possible compositions for two cells. One is when you stack them vertically, and the other one is when you stack them horizontally. Um, so because of this definition in terms of uh, enrichment, which is of course not necessary, but it's one way of defining them, um, these things already come uh, endowed with a notion of a two natural transformation. This just comes from uh, enriched category theory. So usually a natural transformation is um, between ordinary uh, categories is a morphism between functors. So we have the data of uh, a map so if it's a natural transformation from F to G, we have a map from F of X to G of X for every object. And then uh, if you disregard the two dimensional part in this diagram here, you require uh, strict commutativity. This is for the one dimensional uh, case. For the two dimensional case, uh, as long as we talk about uh, two natural transformations in the strict sense, then the picture is uh, slightly more complicated. You can see there's a two dimensional uh, part in here that has to be uh, so that so the, the the data of the natural transformation has to be uh, have to be compatible with uh, also this new um, two dimensional part that uh, of course is not available for for uh, just ordinary categories. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. So I'm not going to ask if there are any questions, but uh, you can interrupt uh, whenever you want if I'm not clear. Or, so, um, so this is the picture for what a, um, a two natural transformation is uh, between two functors between two categories. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, an important uh, fact is that uh, there's a natural isomorphism, which of course generalizes the, the usual one for ordinary categories. Uh, and this is an, uh, an isomorphism of um, two categories, but even just as at the level of sets, it's it's already interesting, uh, and we have that um, two functors uh, from a product uh, of C and D into, into E uh, are in bijective correspondence with functors from C into this uh, 
Functor 2 category, if you like. Uh, now, here there are some possible choices to be made in that um, there are di different levels of laxity uh, for functors and for natural transformations. I will introduce this um, little by little during this talk, but uh, for the moment here I'm considering the strictest uh, possible uh, version of this. So uh, the objects of this exponential here are uh, two functors, uh, the cells are strict uh, to natural transformations, and then we have modifications as two cells. We I don't need to go over what these modifications are. We don't, we, this won't be needed. But just keep in mind that it is uh, a two category. So it's got uh, also two dimensional um, part. Okay, so the first um, possible uh, weakening of, uh, that, that can be made in this context is that of relaxing the notion of a two natural transformation. So now we have access to, uh, to two cells. Therefore, instead of just requiring commutativity on the nose, we can add uh, a piece of structure to alpha, to our natural transformation. So now the, da the, the data is not just these one cells, but also these two cells, which note are indexed by the one cells in the indexing category. Uh, so this F is the one that appears here and here. And, uh, and oh, sorry, there's a, I'm sorry, there's a, mistake that I've just so uh, wait I think this is correct okay this is a whole mess in that the lux and oplux notation are I, I think this these are the most widely um, used but I also believe that there is not a universal agreement on this but this is the one that I'm gonna use so um, in adding these two cells there's a choice so the two cell can go up meaning from this composite to this composite or it can go down, so from this composite to this one. Now, if we require these two cells to be invertible, this would not make uh, a huge difference. Of course, you can always reverse the cell and you can do that coherently, so it's not a huge uh, uh, problem. But because these two cells are not required to be invertible, and when I say invertible, you should uh, imagine this as having uh, on the nose inverses on the left and on the right um, with respect to the vertical composition. So there, there are two possible choices, and the one on the left, the one that goes up, uh, I, will, I will call that, I will refer to that uh, with the lux term, and oplux for the one that goes down. Uh, okay, so these are, I mean, these are technical aspects that do play some roles in when you want to prove things or, or really delve into the details, but otherwise, it's more or less, everything is more or less self-dual, uh, in a sense. Okay, so uh, with having in mind this possible weakening for natural transformations, one could ask, can we replace uh, this product here with something uh, so that this uh, representability condition is satisfied when here, instead of strict uh, natural transformations, we instead use uh, lax natural transformation. So can we replace, can we replace uh, the Cartesian product by another monoidal structure, so another tensor product, um, so that uh, on the right, we can now put two functors, lax natural transformations and uh, modifications. So uh, this is a problem that's been solved uh, classically, I believe uh, 50 years ago, if not, if not more. Uh, the answer is yes. And this substitute is the oplax gray tensor product. So uh, essentially there are two versions, uh, oplax and lax corresponding to uh, different directions of uh, the, um, the two cells in the, in the natural uh, transformations. And so this is uh, usually denoted uh, in this way. So classically, I know uh, two constructions of this. Uh, one is given by means of generators and relations, and the other one, I believe is due to street. Uh, it, it's an unpublished set of nodes, and, it's, and it, it exploits the density of cubes in 2CAT. So however you want to construct it, once you prove that you have this uh, representability result, then of course they're going to be isomorphic. So it doesn't really matter uh, how you define it. But it's, it's interesting that there are at least two ways of defining that, and of course I'm sure there are um, plenty uh, more. So uh, I don't want to go into the details of how this is constructed. I don't think it's particularly instructive here uh, for the moment. Of course I will define it precisely in the context of infinity two categories. Um, the only thing that's um, 
worth pointing out at this point is that if we look at uh, the free category on a one cell, uh, so this looks like looks like this. We have an object, um, and we have um, we have two objects and just a single uh, non-identity one cell uh, going from uh, one to the other. Now, if we take the product of this category with itself, what this looks like is the commutative square, and this is the reason why uh, the product represents uh, strict natural transformations, essentially because you get commutative squares. Morally, that's, that's one way of seeing it. Whereas if you take the great answer product uh, of the um, one arrow category, the, the, the free living one cell with itself, you get a square filled by a two cell. And now, of course, the direction depends on the kind of um, laxity that I put on the on the on the greater two products. So if I choose up lax, then it goes down. If I choose lax, it goes up. And you can always get one uh, or the other by swapping the factors. So if you want to get the lax version, you can use the up lax but swapping um, the, the 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 categories that you're tensoring. Okay, so so this is uh, pretty much everything I wanted to say uh, for the great answer product in uh, two categories. So I want to move to uh, lax and op lax factors. So so far we have weakened um, the the um, we, we have given a weakened uh, version of natural transformations. But of course nothing prevents us from uh, a further um, weakening in the in in this time with factors. So uh, again I will somehow sketch the definition and not be uh, too uh, pedantic about it. So um, uh, an oplax uh, or lax functor uh, F from C to D consists of, um, as far as assignments, we have some more assignments, but we start with the same assignments on, on zero cells, one cells, and two cells. And you can see here that uh, there's already some compatibility going on. Uh, in fact, um, if f goes from x to y, f of f has to go from f of x to f of y. And um, if, if we're given a two cell alpha from f to g, then f of alpha has to go from f of f to f of g. This is pretty natural to, to require. Now, uh, as far as extra uh, data, we also uh, are given for every pair of composable one cells, where composable means that they can be arranged in such way, um, we can either compose in C and apply F, or we can first apply F to both and not notice that they will still be composable, and then we can compose them in D. Uh, these things need not be the same if, in the case of uh, lax or plax functors, and we're given a two, a two cell um, either in this direction if it's oplax, or in this direction uh, if it's lax. Uh, but in the case, so this is, this is uh, as far as composition of one cell, as far as composition of two cells, we don't, so the vertical composition is respected because we really cannot do much more. We don't have three cells. And as far as horizontal composition of two cells, then here we have uh, to take into account also this, oops, sorry, also this. So it gets a little more complicated, but uh, this is, this is, um, somehow a sketch of the picture. And now also, um, so not just for composition, but another piece of structure that we have is uh, the identities. And in this case, we do not require a strict preservation of them, but rather, again, the existence of a comparison uh, between the, the two possibilities. And uh, if all of these constraints are required to be invertible, we get the notion of pseudo functor. And again, the direction at that point does not matter uh, a lot. Whereas in this case, lax and oplax are genuinely different, and um, uh, we will mostly focus on oplax um, for a reason that will be clear, uh, that that will make clear uh, in, in what follows. Um, okay, now uh, an, an important observation is that um, if we look at this condition here, and if we replace it, if we replace the uh, requirement of a two cell with an equality, so we weaken the uh, composition part, but not the identity part, then we get the normalized version. So I will speak about normalized oplax uh, factors. Um, 
a fact that um, follows immediately from uh, the essentially this sketch of definition that I gave is that vertically invertible two cells are preserved. And uh, I draw them as two simplices uh, for a reason that, because this will be um, strictly connected with, of course, the simplicial context that's going to come up in a second. So if you have a vertically invertible two cell, then this is going to be, its image is going to be, uh, again, invertible. Uh, but one thing that I want to stress is that OPLAX two functors need not preserve uh, isomorphic one cells or equivalences. So just, a, just a, an anticipation, this is the reason why um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you construct uh, a functor two category having as objects lax functors, then this thing is not uh, homotopically meaningful, or, or I should say um, compatible with equivalences, in that if you have um, an equivalence of two categories, and then you look at, and then you have a third uh, two category, and you look at lax functors from uh, the first one into the third one, or the second one into the third one, then this need not be equivalent. And this is uh, a direct consequence of, of this fact here. So this is one thing that we have to fix, because of course we want everything to be um, homotopically meaningful in our context. Uh, so we will fix this, and moreover, uh, this also gives us an insight on how to fix it for, um, for, for two categories, basically requiring um, this thing uh, to actually hold. So that, that would give you um, something that's homotopically meaningful even in the, in the ordinary uh, case. But this, is, this, is, this seems to have been not considered uh, in the past. Um, okay, so this is it for two categories, at least for the moment. So I wanna move, um, I wanna briefly uh, introduce the, the setting in which the work uh, happens. So uh, we will scale simplicial sets uh, so these are uh, simplicial sets that come equipped with a scaling. What the scaling is, is uh, a selection of a subset of thin two simplices. So essentially, um, simplicial sets have simplices uh, in every um, non-negative dimension, and we, we select a subset of the two simplices, and we think of them as being the invertible ones. Uh, it's not just that we think of them as being that, but uh, this is reflected, of course, in the... Um, in the infinity categorical structure that's, that's underneath all of this. Uh, so these two simplices look like this and we think of them as being invertible. Now maps between scaled simplicial sets are simply maps between the underlying simplicial sets and they are required to preserve the scaling, but uh, nothing else. Well, um, just maybe another thing that I should say is that um, the generative two simplices are required to be thin, but that's really much all, all, all that's required. Faces uh, need not be, um, there's no requirement on faces or degeneracies or anything. So this is, this is just uh, the ambient category, uh, but because we need some homotopy theory, we need to introduce a model structure on it. I mean, this is one possible way of doing that. And uh, there's a theorem, which is due to Luri, and uh, that says that there's a model structure uh, on the category scale simplicial sets. Uh, here I say uh, it's a model structure for infinity two categories. Now what this means is it, it, it's a statement that can be made precise, but it should be enough um, to, to think of it as being equivalent to every other known model of uh, infinity two uh, categories. So this is, this is what I mean. It can be made precise, but uh, it's, it's going to be enough for the, for the uh, purpose of this talk. And uh, this model structure, of course, as, as every model structure, is fully described by its fibron objects and its co-fibrations. The fibron objects, uh, are referred to as infinity by categories, and the cofibrations are the monomorphisms. So these infinity by categories are really the, the our object of, of, of study. So these are the, the, the real infinity two categories, just like uh, in, in the Joyal model structure, one only considers like the good objects, the fibron ones, so not, not, not all of them. And this can be uh, characterized by uh, a lifting property. So this is a result of uh, one of our previous papers uh, in which uh, we proved that um, there's a, a set of of, uh, of maps uh, that characterize these these infinity by categories. These 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 are just uh, some sort of a generalization of inner horns that you uh, that you have for quasi categories plus some other some other maps. So not just inner horns; those are not enough. Eduardo, yes. Can I ask you when you view by categories as infinity by categories? Mm -hmm. um, what do the maps of 
infinity by categories correspond to at the by category uh, level? Uh, pseudo functors. Just pseudo functors, exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I suppose yeah. normal pseudo functors. Yeah. Uh, right. To be uh, yeah, yeah. absolutely precise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something that I was gonna. Uh, stress in a, in a few minutes basically there's no way if, if you just if, if, if your maps have to be maps of simplicial sets plus stuff there's no way of avoiding the normalized uh, thing okay no I was just um, curious whether they were like normal lax functors that preserve equivalences or something uh, oh no they, they're pseudo uh, they're okay. pseudo because essentially because um, composition is witnessed by a thin to simplex and this thin to simplex has to be preserved by the maps. Okay. Therefore, uh, if something is a composition, it remains a composition. Up to, okay. but of course up to uh, an ISO, not, not on the nose because there's, there's not even a way of, of, of um, speaking about things that are equal on the nose. Okay, um, and um, similarly to what happens for two categories, one could uh, think of these things as being uh, infinity categories enriched over infinity one categories. I know there's a little bit of a clash of terminology because these infinity categories are infinity one categories, but this is just to highlight two different aspects of it. So this means that we're, we have a set of objects and for every pair of objects, we're given an infinity category this time. And for every pair of one cells, we're given a space or a can complex or an infinity group, or these are all the same thing, uh, of uh, morphisms between them. So this is, this is roughly the, the structure that we have, uh, if, if you're not familiar with, with, with this kind of things. Um, okay, so to begin with, I want to define uh, what the space of Oplax uh, functors between uh, two given infinity by categories is. So this, we assume this is an infinity by category and this as well, so this is a simplicial set and this is a scaling on it. Same thing for this one and this one. And I want to define the space. Of, of course, it, it doesn't have to be a space. I mean, this is, this is in fact an infinity two category, but let's just focus on spaces for the moment. That's enough for the universal property. Um, so um, a space of Oplax maps, this is defined as the space of maps um, between what? Well, the codomain stays the same because anyway, we want it to be vibrant. So that's, that's a good thing. We, we leave it the same. The only thing that we alter is the scaling on the domain. Okay, so we start with a scaling which is given and which makes uh, this pair into an infinity two category. Uh, but then we reduce it. How do we do that? Well, we restrict to those which are invertible. So those which are uh, effectively in uh, T of C but with a, with, a, with a further requirement. So either the edge from zero to one or the edge from one to two has to be invertible in C. Now here there are some clarifications that I have to make. First of all, I'm talking about edges. Maybe it's better if, if I draw something. Uh, okay, so this is what a two simplex look like in general. Um, so what I'm saying is that two things are required. So these have to be thin because I'm saying it belongs to the scaling of C. But now either this one has to be invertible or this one has to be invertible. And also I haven't said what invertible means and I have a picture here. So this is what it means to be invertible. Um, actually, uh, I can also, so this can be, this need not be the same, could be a G prime. So basically th this is the picture F is invertible. If I can find a G prime and a G uh, going in the opposite direction, and a pair of thin two simplices uh, of this shape. So basically this is telling you that G prime F is the identity and FG is the identity, is equivalent to, okay? So th this, is the, this is a natural notion of uh, invertible one cell in, um, in C. Of course, it's not the, the, the only one. There are some theorems to, to prove that this is a coherent notion, but this has all been uh, documented. Okay, so this is, this is um, so, this defines the space of Oplax, uh, and um, I, I'm just writing Oplax for simplicity, but in fact, these are normalized. Uh, and this is due to the fact that identities are represented by degenerate uh, one simplices, like this. And therefore, uh, these have to be preserved by, this, by simplicial maps, by definition. So identities are preserved uh, on the nose. So these are normalized, but just not to make the notation too heavy, 
uh, I just use Oblux. Uh, okay, so the first interesting result is that if we're given an equivalence, uh, by categorical equivalence simply means an equivalence of infinity two categories. You can think of this as being a weak equivalence, or in this case, a homotopy equivalence um, with respect to the model structure that I mentioned earlier. But um, otherwise, if you want to think of it in a sort of in a model independent uh, fashion, then this is an essentially subjective and fully faithful uh, map between the between the um, between C and D. So if, if, if this is what we're given, then the restrict, of course, if, if we restrict the scaling uh, in the domain to, to this L of C, then this will be mapped into L of D because invertible uh, one cells are preserved, thin two synthesis are preserved. So we do get this restriction. And this is, again, a bicategorical equivalence. Uh, of course, these may not be vibrant, but um, this all works out uh, anyway. This is just a remark for, for uh, just to be more precise. Uh, and so an important consequence of this is that uh, the OPLAX mapping space is, um, it respects equivalences, which again, as I said, this was not true in the classical context with the classical uh, definition. But this is, this is something that we needed and so uh, it's, it's, it's good that uh, it behaves well in this context. So yeah, here, this is me stressing the fact that in the ordinary version, uh, this does not work. Now you may ask, uh, why is this a good notion of an OPLUX functor? And in fact, uh, if I don't spend any words on it, it could just not make sense. Um, so here's a picture. Suppose that, so the fact that um, a map is a composite of two other maps in this context is witnessed by an invertible two cell or a thin two simplex to be precise. So suppose we have composable one cells or one simplices G and F, then to witness their composition, we just select a thin two simplex of this four where this GF is just, of course, a name that I'm giving. Now, if we apply uh, a no plaques uh, functor to this, what do we get? We now only get a two simplex because, uh, I mean, in general, uh, neither G nor F are invertible. So we're we are assuming that, uh, we're not assuming that. Therefore, this thin two simplex need not be preserved. Uh, in fact, remember that the only ones that are preserved are, are those uh, such that one of the two, uh, let's say, diagonal edges are invertible. In this case, a priori, none of the two is, therefore this need not be preserved. And so what we get is a two simplex that uh, goes from F of GF to uh, the composite of F, and G, F of G and F of F. Um, the fact that I'm uh, just looking at OPLAX is due to the uh, convention that two simplices have this direction. This is, this is not just a convention, this is reflected in um, some constructions that one can make, including um, uh, a coherent nerve, <clears throat> sorry, that goes from um, um, categories enriched over marked simplicial sets to scale simplicial sets and so on. So there are some choices to be made and these choices force this direction here. So as you can see, this is the OPLAX version because it goes from F of the composite to the composite of the Fs. Um, therefore, uh, this is why I'm only looking at OPLAX, but one could uh, dualize this and get uh, the other one. But uh, I mean, let's just, just, let's just look at this one for now. So the idea is to um, define uh, an object, which is this, this tensor here. So a great tensor product in this context, uh, so that some conditions are, are verified. So we want uh, this, the space of maps from this uh, candidate into, into any uh, Z to be equivalent to uh, something which I'm now going to specify. So uh, we want it to be, so if we just look at this part here, then this is the thing I've just defined. This is the uh, space of maps from the product of X and Y uh, into Z. But uh, we impose a further condition. So we want this, this space of maps to be equivalent to a subspace of it. This is what this tilde stands for. So it's a subspace of this and it is spanned by uh, those OPLAX maps 
such that two conditions are verified. So the first one is that if we restrict to uh, a point in X times Y, so this is isomorphic to Y, or uh, X times a point in Y for every possible choice, then these have to be ordinary maps. So a priori, the restriction is just an Oplax map, but uh, we want to only look at the subspace uh, such that these are uh, ordinary maps. So you can think of them as being uh, normalized pseudo functors if you want. Uh, and so this is one condition. The second condition is that uh, for every possible uh, choice of a one simplex in X and a one simplex in Y, then we can always, of course, construct these two simplex in the, in the product, which is given by first moving along F and uh, fixing Y, and then moving along G and fixing X prime, or moving along F and G at the same time, we do get a two simplex, and we require this two simplex in the product to be mapped to a thin one uh, in Z. So these are two conditions. We can take the space spanned by, by this, and of course, if one wanted to uh, increase the, the, the um, let's say, the dimensionality of this equivalence, of course, one can require these to be a full sub-infinity two category, and this is in fact true. Um, okay, but as I said, I'm just looking at the space for, for in, in the paper we do it uh, for that level of generality, but I think it's just simpler to think about spaces for the moment. Um, so these are two conditions that we impose and this uh, identify a subspace. And we want to do two things, find a representative here and prove that uh, this equivalence um, holds true. Now, uh, one reason. Can I ask? Uh, yeah, of course. Is this supposed yeah, yeah. to be connected to the notion of a cubical functor? So, so the gray has. Uh, so I think gray described uh, the gray tensor product. One of the formulations was as classifying uh, yes. cubical functors mm -hmm. in two mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks a little bit like this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Part, anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely um, sort of inspired uh, by that. Yes. Okay. So these are these these are this this is the cubical condition, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, so some uh, justification for this condition, you can see it here. Um, given such an f and g, we can build um, a, a square, which is it's a, it's a simplicial square. So this is a. It appears as delta one times delta one. So we have a pair of two simplices, one that goes, because they both go from the diagonal to the composite. This is just because of the convention that we chose. Of course, if you choose the opposite, then you still have the same problem, except they all point towards the diagonal. But the thing is, one goes down, one goes up. Here, we are requiring this to be invertible. What this means is that from this composite here, we can now go down using the inverse and then go further down using this one. So now this square here up to homotopy looks like this, which is, which is if you remember, sort of the basic shape. Um, it's, it's one of the features that I uh, highlighted uh, some minutes ago about the great tensor product of two free living one cells. So this is, I would say, a pretty strong justification for, for this requirement. And also, I should also say that these requirements were not uh, introduced by us, but these are in the um, in the famous appendix that I that I quoted um, again at the beginning of the talk. Okay, so let's define this candidate. Um, so th there are a lot of definitions for great answer products available in the rich literature right now. It's um, it's become pretty trendy, so we have it in very uh, in, we have it in a lot of models. It's available in a lot of models for for these infinity two categories. It's available for the completion model and in a, also in a greater generality in that uh, that's given for infinity infinity categories. Uh, we have it in um, two quasi categories, and um, I believe that's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You can reflect the one on, on, on completion sets to um, two completion sets, so you get one for infinity two categories, um, also also in that also in that setting. So this is the definition is nothing, um, it's not too new or surprising, but uh, it's got one advantage which I will um, uh, highlight in a second. So let's define it. We have two scale simplicial sets. We want to define 
uh, their great answer products. So I have to give you a simplicial set and a scaling on it. So the underlying simplicial set is just the Cartesian product. And the scaling is given as follows. So a two simplex in the, in the product, of course, it's a pair of two simplices, so alpha and beta, where alpha is, is a thin, uh, we require it to be a thin uh, two simplex in X. And uh, beta, we want it to be a, a thin simplex in Y. These are forced as choices. Uh, and then also we, we, we further impose the condition that either alpha is the generate along one, two, or beta is the generate along zero, one in Y. Now, uh, in, in our paper, we prove several, um, let's say generalization of this or, uh, or um, so we give different scalings which all give rise to the same um, um, infinity to uh, by category upon replacement. So essentially this is one of the possible, but you can also weaken this. You can require uh, invertible instead of the generate. You can, you can require uh, that is the generate uh, either along zero one or that just zero one is the generate. So there are several uh, variations that we needed uh, essentially from a technical point of view, because sometimes for some proofs, it's, it's easier to use one or the other, but they're all equivalent. Um, so uh, this is just one of the possible, uh, of the possible choices. Notice that in the um, completion setting, one would require these to be marked, but we could, because we don't have a marking in dimension one, then this cannot be done. Uh, but then since marking in dimension one can be recovered by the scaling, so by the, by the marking in dimension two, then this is, uh, this, this is the reason why it's equivalent. And another thing that we show is that, um, so in a previous paper, we proved that scale simplicial sets are equivalent to two completion sets, and, under, and this equivalence is also monoidal with respect to the great answer products defined in uh, both settings. So it's, it's a nice compatibility, and it's a nice, uh, let's say, sanity check for this. Uh, one of the advantages is that uh, this is associative on the nose, whereas the marking in dimension one creates some problems that make it not associative on the nose. And it also, um, and it can be organized into quill and bifunctor, so it's, it's compatible with the, the model structure for infinity two uh, categories. So this is, this is the definition of the, of the grid tensor product. Now, we have inclusions of the following form. So this grid tensor product can be included in the scaled simplicial set, whose underlying simplicial set is, again, the Cartesian product, but we change the scaling in that we do not require this to be degenerate, but rather just invertible. So this is something that I anticipated a second ago. If you do this, you get an equivalence, okay? So we can look at this diagram here. We have the great answer product that we just defined. We have this slight um, uh, enlargement, but just in the scaling. And uh, we can also look at this inclusion here, which is we take again the Cartesian product, but we take the, let's call it the lax scaling. So this is the one I introduced uh, just a second ago where um, we require the two simplex to be uh, invertible uh, either along one side or the other. And now notice that this forces both simplices to be such because we're saying that a two simplex in here, which is a pair, uh, one in X, one in Y, has to be invertible along one edge. So it's going to be invertible in both X and Y. Whereas in this one here, only on, in one side is required. So that's why there's, there's a, an inclusion like that. Whereas this one is an equivalence. Thanks to this diagram, we get a restriction functor um, of this form, right? So basically uh, this one here, we invert the equivalence, we get this one here, and then we restrict and we get a uh, map uh, out of this, but map, with this scaling correspond to the OPLAX, okay? So this diagram here induces uh, this map. And this is what we want, right? Because the statement of the theorem uh, that we want to prove, sorry for scrolling, it's that um, this thing is equivalent to a subspace of that. So we have the map and we just have to verify that uh, it is uh, fully faithful and that the essential image is precisely the thing that we want. Um, and this is in fact the, the final theorem, the, the one that I want to uh, conclude with, and is that this map here indeed identifies the domain, so the space of maps from the great answer product uh, uh, into Z, as the subspace of the OPLAX maps from the product, satisfying the two properties that I have uh, outlined um, 
above. So I think I will I'll stop here. John, John, you're muted at the moment. Uh, thanks, Eduardo. And we can continue doing these silent applause, I guess. Very nice talk. Um, so would anyone like to ask a question? So if you would like to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so I can appear. Yeah. Let me see if it's working. I don't really have a question, but I, I think it's very nice. Um, you know, I remember, I, you know, I saw the paper go up on the archive a couple of months ago and I thought it was a, a really good idea to connect the, uh, you know, this great sense of product for scaled superficial sets with the lax functors. I, you know, I thought that was a great idea when I uh, saw that. Yeah, I mean, um, so the, the thing is uh, now to, to complete the comparison with, with Gates Curry and Rosenblum's uh, version is that uh, one has to compare now instead of the great answer product, now it's, it's a matter of comparing um, the two notions of lax functors. So theirs is um, slightly different because it's given with a different, with a different model. And um, so that's sort of the, the, the step that, that's, that, that remains uh, to, to get a full uh, equivalence between the two things, but yeah. Uh, one question. Um, I'm more used, a bit more used to thinking about this question for the pseudo great tensor product of two categories, um, which is closely related to the Cartesian one. So you have a map from the great tensor product to the Cartesian one, which is a equivalence in the in the pseudo case and for the lax case i guess it i think it i'm not 100 percent sure about this but i think it might be related by an adjunction so i'm not 100 percent sure about that or by a sort of local adjunction so i'm just since you have a very obviously defined sort of map to the cartesian product since they're just defined as the cartesian product with a different scaling i'm just curious whether you can say some sort of homotopical lifting properties of that map or something like um that. so uh if i understood correctly the question so uh well firstly in this context the the pseudo great answer product is just a product uh so 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 that, that's that's one thing and then as far as the lax one uh the cartesian product is a localization of the great answer product so it's 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 obtained in this context by inverting some two simplices. Mm -hmm. That should be that should be should be correct. Um, so this is this is the somehow how, how the two things are related. So you have an inclusion, and it's it's um, it's essentially a localization in this in this sense that I that I just said. Uh, and this is roughly because if you if you um, recall the the image of the square where only one of the two simplices were was invertible um the one pointing upward now uh if you also invert the one that goes down that that looks like the product of uh the free living one cell with itself and if you do this for every possible choice then you're left with the cartesian product so i'm not sure if this answers your question so it's it's a localization so if and the sorry? question then is does i mean I guess it shows that it's a localization. You're looking at a map to a localization, and sometimes maps to localizations have adjoints. Mm -hmm. I guess my question was whether it has an adjoint, but it's close to answering my question. Um, I mean, um, I don't know, it does seem unlikely to me because the underlying simplicial set is the same. So, um, what other candidates do you have besides the identity? I don't know. No, yeah, no. I don't know. Anyway, it's just, I was just curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. I think. I think uh, the most intelligent thing I can say is the thing I said. I don't think okay. I have other. <laughs> I don't think I have other things. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? Just a, a literature remark. John brought up the cool. cubicle functors earlier, but my recollection is that uh, in Gray's book, he also does explicitly give the comparison or the representation of the gray tensor products 
in terms of you know these normal or black sphincters satisfying that those extra pair of okay. conditions. But of course, you know things are identities rather than isomorphisms and so on. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So so that's already in grey. Yeah, yeah. I can find you like the page number and everything later if you like. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, he calls uh, normal func. He, call, he calls lax functors pseudo functors. So it's sort of uh, uh, very difficult to, to find these uh, things. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's uh, another reference. Is the it's the more recent one is the. Um, I believe it's Donald Yao's book, and I think it's he has a co-author, which unfortunately I don't remember. It's sort of Miles a companion. Miles Johnson, book. possibly. I don't right. remember, and it's it's just a, it's a book about two categories, sort of a mm. compendium of of it's like a collection of, of facts, and uh, they have a section on the great answer product, and it's 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 pretty nicely uh, done in that they have these cubicle functors, and so it's built upon that, and uh, that's maybe. I would say maybe a, a bit more readable. I don't know, but um, yeah. Okay. Well, if, uh, if there are no further questions, then we can uh, thank Eduardo again. Thanks. And, uh, and that's it. So, so we can stop recording, and we're going to have. Uh, sorry, maybe I'll say we'll. We're going to have a talk by Raphael Stenzel in two weeks. Uh, yeah, so that'll probably be the next one. I'll send an email about that so, uh, so we can...